I would like to call this meeting to order. Today's date is Tuesday, March 15th, 2022. This is a special board meeting of the Governing Board of San Marcos Unified School District. Please let the record reflect that all board members are present, except for Member Carlson, who is absent. The San Marcos Unified School District is an innovative and collaborative community providing an unparalleled educational experience. Through an engaging and supportive environment, all of our students are challenged, inspired, and poised to excel. Please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. Approval of the agenda. Um, do I have a motion to approve the agenda? A motion to approve the agenda. I'll second. Moved by Jamie, seconded by Sarah to approve the agenda. Board members in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. 3.0 communication session. Please note that during a special board meeting, only items listed on the agenda may be addressed to the board. If you wish to address the board, please complete a white request form located in the alcove to the left of the double doors as you enter the boardroom. Please give it to Dana. Um, uh, each speaker is allowed a maximum of three minutes to speak, except for our union representatives who have five minutes. Members of the board are very limited in their response to statements or questions per the Brown Act. Unless an item has been placed on the published agenda, there shall be no action taken. The board may one, acknowledge receipt of the information, report and comment, two, refer to staff for further study, or three, refer the matter to the next agenda. An audio tape recording is made of all open sessions of the governing board. Again, on behalf of Board of Education, we thank you in advance for helping us conduct this meeting respectfully. Dana, do you have anyone who would like to speak? Yes, I would like to ask Yvonne Brett to come up, please. First one. <laughs> okay, good evening. Yesterday was a terrible day for 86 of our classified employees, most who were completely stunned by their layoff letters. Part of the district's vision statement that you read each month to start your meeting reads, through an engaging and supportive environment, all our students are challenged, inspired, and poised to excel. So your goal is to provide an engaging and supportive environment to students. Yet you upended the lives of all these people who have been faithfully working for this district, some of them well over two decades. How about providing a supportive environment for these human beings? Each and every one of them made the choice to work for our district because they want to support our teachers and our students. These layoffs are destroying the little scrap of morale that is left for all our classified employees after two years of working their own jobs, plus a variety of additional duties during these very unsettling times. Our negotiation team was trying to get some clarity as to how these layoff decisions were made. In regards to the clerical positions, we were told that choices were made because it appeared that particular sites were overstaffed. There were no work studies done to see what these employees actually do, which vary greatly at their individual sites. When we asked who would be doing the work at the, of the laid off employees, we were told that their work would be absorbed by the remaining employees or additional hours would be offered to them. So paying someone time and a half saves the district money. Will our full-time full employees even want to work these additional hours? Just last week, I was told that a plan was being formulated to give my library, five, my library five student aides per period next year so that we could send two of them out each period to pick up trash. Yet you're saying laying off 17 custodians because there's no work for them? This past year, we've had custodians come in on weekends to get the cleaning done. Where is the savings when you're paying them time and a half pay? Does this even make any sense? Our custodians have been short staffed ever since the staff was downsized in 2008. And even now they can barely keep ahead of the cleaning with the staff that they have. 
At this point, as we are transitioning from pandemic protocols to an endemic lifestyle, now more than ever, we need to keep these trained and experienced employees in their jobs. The time and money that has been invested in these employees will disappear when you let them go. These layoffs are cruel and destroying the goodwill of your classified staff. Do the right thing and find a different way to solve your budget crisis. Diana Kavanaugh. Hello, I've worked for San Marcos Unified since 1999. I've worked at San Alejo Middle School since it opened in 2004. And I've worked as the data technician too since 2011. Yesterday, I received a pink slip. My job will be eliminated on June 30th. Who is going to do the work? I'm employed by a district that claims their educational and business practices are data-driven and data-informed. And yet my job is on the chopping block because an assistant superintendent of business services thought the middle schools looked heavy on clerical positions. Was a work study conducted? Were principals consulted? Did this soup or any other visit middle schools to observe how clerical staff operates? I don't mean the superficial one hour tours that you all make to say that you've set foot on every campus in the district. I mean dedicating a few hours or a day to shadowing staff while we interact with students and teachers and parents. Since this data was not collected, truly the most insulting part of the pink slip process has been reading Superintendent Andy Johnson's email. This process has been undertaken with extremely careful consideration. Again, who is going to do the work? Do you, the governing board and administrators, know what duties middle school data technician twos carry out? Are you aware that school site data technicians tasks differ from district office data technicians? The data technician two is an integral part of the middle school office staff. Although we're housed in the counseling office, our job supports all offices on campus, counseling, assistant principals, and front office. Duties vary by school. My duties include developing and maintaining databases for our 96 504 accommodation plan students, eighth grade awards, counseling groups, California Junior Scholarship Federation, and more. Creating our promotion program, running data lists for school-wide events like picture day and mask distribution, posting to our website, master calendar, public viewing calendar, and at SEMS Eagle Twitter account, Sending school messenger calls and emails, responding to parent calls and emails, assisting with parent view issues, residency verification, and events such as promotion, welcome back days, and distribution days. Engaging students and inspiring futures is a hands-on job that happens on school sites. While the district claims that site staff cuts are necessary budget reductions, district office staff grows. A few years ago, we have added a communications officer. Recently, we added a public information officer in a newly created position that supersedes that. And at a salary that nearly covers the three salaries of the middle school data technician twos that the district claims they can no longer afford. Thank Who you. is Your going to up. do the work? Joey Neptune. Joey Neptune. Good evening. I'm a physical education teacher at SEMS, a father of two at SEAS, and I'm here to support elementary physical education. I know our subject is seen as just PE or glorified recess. I know most assume we just roll out a ball or make kids run. I also know that teaching PE is seen as a demotion, as if we're either incapable of teaching something else or we didn't do a good enough job in a core subject classroom. None of this is true. We teach a physically and cognitively academic class. More importantly, 
This is the only subject which, by the very nature of its content, has the potential to affect how a person will feel every moment of every day for the rest of their life. I witnessed this firsthand growing up with a mom who was fighting and continues to fight multiple sclerosis. I witnessed the value of this subject when my dad recently lost his battle with cancer. Does my mom ever have a day in which she doesn't think about her health? No. Did my dad? No. Do you ever have a day in which you don't think about your health in some form? Whether it's making food choices, exercise, weight loss, sleep habits, stress and anxiety, depression, pain management, and on and on. The answer is a resounding no. Our world cannot function without good health. We saw that with that little thing we call COVID. So why then is it being proposed to reduce the one class that sets the foundation of health for our youngest students? Active kids become active adults. Elementary PE is reduced to part-time, and there's a mix of sometimes up to seven classes together at one time. Is it realistic to think that most students will take anything away from that? Again, despite the, the passion, education, and commitment of our elementary staff, the answer is no. And those teachers will then spend the same amount of time and effort, make half their wage to manage and not to teach. We always hear that decisions are made for kids. Let's look at some stats relating to that. PE classes help increase test scores and student focus. Active children outperform less active children in both the long and the short term. Active students show better classroom behavior and lower rates of absenteeism. The USA obesity rate is now at 42.4%. Additionally, our society is the most anxious, depressed, and suicidal has ever been. And we wanna reduce the class that focus on health on every level. You cannot argue against the natural remedy that exercise is, and you can't Google being healthy. Make me healthy. That may be beyond my abilities at the moment. You actually have to learn this and apply it for your lifetime. Let's not take that away from these kids. Thank you. Tamara Miller. Tamara Miller. Good afternoon. My name is Tamara Miller, and I'm here back again to implore you to reverse your decision on cutting elementary physical education back to part time. I stood up here at the beginning of the month and gave you some background information on why your plan to cripple our elementary physical education program is not smart for students and sites. Passion for my job has brought me back today. Yesterday, many teachers were pink slipped throughout our district. My heart goes out to them. I've received a pink slip before, but did not this time since I have seniority in the district. So I will end up teaching at one of the middle or high schools. However, what happens to my program when I, that I've worked so hard on at our school when I leave? I'll tell you, it's gone. Someone new will come in and start to teach and create their program. However, they won't stay because teacher retention is terrible with a position that is 3.5 hours a day. It was one of the main reasons that our principals asked for full-time physical education and still want it. Also, did you know there's a lack of physical, physical educators in the county right now? They're going to be open positions throughout the county and the people you pink slipped will go to fill those positions. They will leave and you'll be left without bodies since it feels like that's how you only look at us. Then you will have no program, no aides, no subs, and no teachers. But you'll have PE still, right? No, not anything like our physical education programs now. At the meeting, you guys stood up here and said, remember, we used to do it like this before. There are many things in education that we used to do that we no longer do because they're not effective, safe, engaging, inclusive, or any of the other things that our programs have grown to be since we've switched to full-time. But that's what you're imposing on us. 100 kids in a classroom. You would never say to a fourth grade teacher, here's 100 kids, right? Let me say it again. Physical education is a class, a mandated subject. We're required to teach standards. The PE minutes don't even count if we're not doing that. Dr. Johnson, maybe in your other districts, you didn't have dedicated elementary physical educators with quality programs. I would have hoped that you would have come here and been proud that that's what our district offers. 
it's something, it's something we should be proud of and be bragging about, quite frankly, like we do about, like you do about other programs that we offer. Our teachers at our sites know, they see what we do every day. Our parents know how valuable we are. Our students know when they learn proper throwing technique or how and why we track our heart rate. Please think about what you're doing to our students. Every single student, every single elementary student in our district is affected by this decision. It hurts them. Our kids that have gone through a pandemic, our kids who are still recovering from lost social skills, our kids that are behind on their motor and physical skills, our kids who knew, need the knowledge that they will learn in elementary physical education before they go to middle school, where a lot of kids, quite frankly, start hating PE. Okay, so board members, please reverse this decision. Stand up for our students, do what's right. Thank you. Katie Benninger. Hi, I'm Katie Benninger, and I'm speaking tonight because of the devastating cuts being made to the elementary PE program. I am a former SMUSD student and the daughter of an elementary school PE teacher. I went to Carrillo Elementary when PE was part-time, and I would like to share some of my experience. When I was in that class, I was out on the field with seven classes at once. That is over 200 students with one credentialed teacher. It was unsafe for students and unfair to staff. Cutting PE part-time is you making the decision to put children in danger. For all, not only was I put on the field with over 200 other children, I was also only able to work with a credentialed teacher every six weeks. For all the other weeks, I was sent to play games with an aide. Aid jobs can be filled by anyone and do not require training or experience working with children. While these jobs sometimes get filled with amazing qualified people, and we are very lucky for that, Typically, these jobs are filled by college students who are unequipped to handle the amount of pressure put on them by that large of a class size. You would never expect a classroom teacher to teach a lesson to over 200 children at once, but you are asking instructional aides with no teaching credential to do just that. As an elementary student, my physical education consisted of games and a quick talk on the field. Not only did I miss out on a tremendous amount of education, I was also unprepared for middle school PE. I had no knowledge of basic physical education because the classes were so large, our teachers couldn't teach us. I did not know that PE had standards that legally need to be met until I came back to volunteer with my mom. Her class sizes now with full-time PE are still huge, but are so much more manageable and help encourage a safe learning environment where children can excel. It gives her a chance to work with every child and create irreplaceable bonds. She now has the time to not only teach them the standards, but also love them. These teachers love their students and cutting PE to part-time is guaranteeing that they will not have the time to give these kids the support and love they so desperately need and deserve. PE is the only subject with social and emotional standards built into the curriculum. It helps kids with their mental health and well-being. Taking that away from students now after a global pandemic is heartbreaking and unbelievable. You may be able to say that students are getting mandated minutes, but you are taking away support, education, preparation for middle school, and knowingly putting children in a dangerous situation. All I ask is that you take one minute tonight and genuinely think to yourself if those things align with your values and the commitment you made to do what's best for these kids. Thank you. Samantha Webb. Samantha Webb. Hello, everyone. I am a fifth grade teacher at Paloma Elementary School and I've been teaching in the district for five years. I'm speaking to you to address the concerning number of rifts that have been distributed to both our temporary and permanent staff members. This reduction in the number of staff members is extremely detrimental. The only department benefiting from these cuts is the financial department here at the district. Our mission here at SMUSD is for all stakeholders is to put the needs of students first. Students needs go far beyond core curricular areas. 
our students, especially now working through this pandemic, need physical education, social emotional support, and appropriate class sizes. There has been a major shift in priorities from our district. I have personally witnessed the exponentially large number of students who are not living their pre-COVID life. This pandemic has had more than just an academic effect on our students. Now more than ever, we should be adding staff to our teams across the district to come together to meet the needs of the whole child. Our students will never perform if they feel they are a number within a room of 35 plus students. My students excel in my classroom because they feel heard and seen every day. With the proposed cuts, my ability to maintain these strong and life-changing relationships becomes close to impossible when my classroom is bursting at the seams because there are too many students and not enough support. This simply does not make sense that in a time of coming together to overcome these challenges of this pandemic, SMUSD is choosing to cut essential staff members who have endured the trials and tribulations of pandemic teaching. I am not confident that MS, SMUSD is staying true to our mission when taking from students first. Carol Grout. Had a follow up by that one, but I'm going to go ahead. Um, um, good evening, Dr. Johnson and members of the school board. My name is Cheryl Grout. I'm a teacher at Double Peak School, and I've been with the district for 16 years. I'm here on behalf of every child and employee in the district. My colleagues are too scared to speak because they've just been let go, so I feel the need to speak for them. These cuts to our schools will have devastating impact on our students. Firstly, I have a few questions. From the board meeting record since February, there have been 63 certificated staff who have either put in their notice of resignation, retirement, or leave of absence. Wouldn't that adjust your number of RIFs? Also, compared to you know, um, the enrollment from the 1920 school year has gone down by 1,300. So if you divide that by 35 or even 24, that's about you know, 50 positions. So isn't that a wash? You know, I know it's not that simple, but I don't see why we've had so many rifts and why the cuts have gone so deep. So we think it's important that you are transparent with us on why we have so many cuts. In addition, when looking at the cuts, I did not see one certificated management position from the district office being cut. How can we justify cutting essential jobs on the front lines and not consolidate positions at the DO? Our schools need every assistant principal. Please do not cut assistant principals. Teacher, PE teacher, counselor, social workers, they're already overwhelmed. We need more counselors and social workers than, than we can get. It wow. seems to me that a PR position that could be a private contractor type of job, not a full-time $150,000 a year kind of job. I've seen multiple positions created for administrators at the DO over the years. And the bottom line is that every employee group should be affected by our cuts if we are in such dire straits. The school site employees and students have endured such great stress over the last two years. Yesterday was the first day we were able to actually see other smiling faces. The first day in two years. The impact of this pandemic on children is gonna take years to overcome. Many are resilient and doing fine, but there are just as many suffering with mental and emotional issues and struggling socially and academically. If we say we want our students to have an unparalleled educational experience, are they gonna be down here or do we want them up here? We have experienced the sky is falling scenario for years and it's never come to fruition. I understand being conservative, but this is beyond being conservative. In all reality, many teachers notice more than likely they'll have a position next year. These severe cuts are unnecessary and devastating to employees who are already exhausted, stressed, and holding on by a thread. We've given all as we've learned how to teach remotely, working countless hours, constantly adapting during the COVID protocols. Our workloads are ever increasing, and instead of being appreciated, many feel devalued and cast aside. This decimates employee morale and we will lose talented teachers because of it. I'm almost done. I ask that we take a second look at these numbers 
and rescind as many pink slips as possible as quickly as possible. We cannot decimate our schools to skeleton crews. We cannot do this to our kids. Thank you for listening. Leslie Kirk. I'm gonna stand back because I'm really loud. Um, I'm a first grade teacher, so I'm gonna do a visual and I'm gonna talk right to you, Dr. Johnson. Uh, this community and family for the last two years has done this. I'm not even talking about the pandemic. This district has been hurting the last two years. And we have a bit of PTSD. Um, we aren't really trusting of the DL. And for you to come in, we had such hopes, didn't we? We were like, yes! Woo! But sorry. We, um, and when you do this and we look at the numbers, and we're like, and we aren't believing you. And it cuts deep. So next year, when all the people that got the positions come back, we're like, oh, so he was just working with us. We don't want that. We want to work with somebody that's going to repair our hearts that is going to have that family feeling that we all want that we all deserve this is an amazing district and i think you know it and you have to prove it to us because right now we're really skeptical and i want this heart to be whole and ironed out, and that's really difficult. Thank you. Isabella Johnson. Hi, I am a student at San Marcos High School. Um, I am here to advocate for every teacher here, but more importantly, my sixth period teacher, Mrs. Brown. We actually signed a petition. We put it around the school today during lunch from about third period to the end of the day because we love her and she was one of the student or er, teachers that got a pink slip. She shouldn't get that. She has affected she has been one of the best teachers that I've ever had. I have a few teachers from elementary school in here. Um, they do not deserve a pink slip either. But this teacher has had, <laughs> but this teacher has had the most impact on my life in the most traumatizing parts of my life. This pandemic was not easy speaking from a student, detrimental to my learning. I don't know what half of life is right now if I'm being honest, but the teachers here need to be heard. And speaking as a student, I need those teachers, especially my English teacher and no offense, all of you guys too, but <laughs> I also do, I do need all of you, but more specifically, I'm here for my English teacher. If you want the petition, I can give it to you. Cirrus Barhumas. Hello, my name is Cyrus Farhuman, and I'm a junior at San Marcos High School. Ms. Brown is my first period English teacher, and she is one of the numerous teachers being laid off. We, the students, have recently found out that around 97 staff, mostly teachers, are being laid off for lowering enrollment 
However, surrounding districts in the county also have lowering enrollment and are not laying off staff at quite the level SMUSD is. Further, SMUSD recently put out a statement saying that layoffs are being carried out due to increased deficit spending, rising pension costs, and expanded services. While the strain on budget is understandable, it is not reasonable for budget relief to come at the cost of students. Laying off teachers significantly hurts the students of the district, who should be your main concern. Less teachers will mean bigger classroom sizes, less one-on-one -on -one time with your uh, teacher, difficulty focusing, and less of a connection with the class. Instead, budget cuts could go to less essential areas that could be deemed at a later date. My junior year has been highlighted by the time Ms. Brown gives her students before school, during lunch, and after school. She's always there for her students, providing not just academic help, but giving valuable advice on issues we're facing. She talks to us about our interests, listens to our music recommendations, and above all, teaches us English. My skills as a writer and storyteller have been sharpened by Ms. Brown and have now been allowed to be fully expressed within the welcoming environment she has created. She's an amazing teacher and does much more than she is asked to. She's a valuable member of SMHS and laying her off would only harm the already struggling community. Coming back from COVID has been hard enough and will only be made worse by tearing away the connections we've made. These cuts are entirely unnecessary. And when the 2022 through 23 school year comes and you realize that you need teachers to run a school, you will realize your egregious error. You are not only harming students, but the livelihoods of every teacher being laid off. So I ask, do the right thing and do not lay off teachers like Ms. Brown, as they are the glue that hold our school body together. And at the end of the day, what is a school without teachers? Gail Kuchenik. Thank you and good afternoon. Vice President Cindy Kerr, Clerk Jamie Chamberlain, Member Sarah Maud, and Member Carlos Ulloa. My name is Dale Zibin Kuchenik, and I am president of the San Marcos Educators Association. SMEA represents over 1,100 teachers, counselors, social workers, nurses, speech language pathologists, school psychologists, and certificated staff. I'm here tonight to speak on behalf of the 97 of our members who have received a RIF notice. You'll see behind me, or to the side of me, a group of teachers who represent the same amount of certificated employees that was just eliminated. The number is leaving us in a somber mood and a, a mood that was with low morale. The staff reduction comes at a time when California's teacher shortage is at an all time high. The district will regret this decision when they go to rehire these teachers back, only to be told they have found employment in a neighboring district. No other district around us is presenting this amount of rifts, and almost all districts throughout the state are experiencing declining enrollment. This brings me to a personal and relevant anecdote about these current cuts to our members. I wanna share my experience from when I received my notice 11 years ago. At close to the very last day of school, my notice was rescinded, and it was rescinded with this question, how good are you at math? The implications of the sentence was that I had to receive my math credential in order to maintain employment. I'm a social science teacher by trade. Uh, social science to math is an extreme jump, but I value my career and I value working with students and I got my math credential. Only be to, to be told later, I'd be teaching social science, thank goodness. Math teachers, you're great. Um, at any rate, I learned a little math while getting this credential and doing so I have some questions regarding some of the district's math. The district has stated we are down 1200 students. The district has released 50 or so temporary teachers in addition to the 97 who have received notice. That's 147 teachers, staff, certificated, all of this. Our largest school site is San Marcos High School, 3,400 or so students with a certificated staff of 146, almost equal to the amount that we've let go. We are releasing the same amount of certificated teachers, social workers for the entire 3,400 student population of San Marcos High School while only being down 1,200 students. That's 10% of our membership. I would hope the district would also seek to lower the district personnel by 10% as well, so that these cuts are the farthest away from the classroom, or at the very least, equal to the classroom cuts. This makes no sense. I urge the board to question these numbers of released certificated staff. SMEA continues to question making decisions based on historically inaccurate budget projections that result in uneasiness and despair in our members. 
Ninth budget presentation already shows an improvement of $5 million in climbing. That is an improvement of over one third of the projected deficit, and we are only in March. What is the number going to be in the May revise? What is it going to be at June when the budget is passed? Well, we understand the timelines time do, do not line up. The 97 rifts seem excessive and unnecessary to our members. At San Marcos Unified, we do good things, but I'm afraid this will change to at San Marcos Unified, we did good things. We can't lose this feeling of being a family that works together. Think about the staff and families you're impact, impacting with these decisions. Think about what undue anxiety and stress that is causing for staff who want to do what's best for kids. Think about all we have accomplished at SMUSD. We need the actions to back up the praise we have been given. With all this said, I still have hope that we will get back to that family feeling we once had, but it has been very tough and our union's morale is at an all time low and our, our somber is our mood. SMEA will continue to push for any and all budget cuts to stay far away from our classrooms and students. We will continue to look for ways to minimize any and all cuts by using tools such as the early retirement incentive SMEA pushed for. By doing so, we're helping the district because there is a teacher shortage and if these 97 teachers find employment elsewhere, we will not get them back. As I conclude my speech, I ask these teachers to depart so that the board and district can see we are more than numbers. As they walk out of this meeting, know that the district's decisions are not just a number on a piece of paper, but rather a human who has a dedicated professional lives to educate children and prepare them for their future. SMEA will continue to advocate on behalf of our members because we realize what important work they do and we recognize their value. We ask the board to please do the same. Thank you. Thank you. Action agenda. Uh, 4.1, 2021-22 second interim report and qualified budget certification. Aaron, pass it to you. So before I get started, I'd like to give a big thanks to the whole accounting team led by our executive director of finance, Lourdes Hernandez, um, for the hours and days of work that it took to create this re report that I'm presenting tonight. The second interim financial report contains actuals um, financials for this fiscal year through the end of January, with projections for the remainder of the year, February through June. So this is where we are on the annual budget reporting cycle. Second interim um, comes in March every year, and we still have three more budget reports um, for this school year coming up. The next one will be the third interim that is to be um, turned in no later than June 1st. 
at this point in time, we are projecting revenues to come into the general fund of $262.7 million. Um, as normal, the bulk of that's coming from the local control funding formula, over 75% of that, those funds. Um, I think there was a community member here last, um, last board meeting that was talking about property taxes. And, and it is likely that as we, we know housing costs are, are increasing and it is likely that our property taxes um, will increase over time. Um, so just keep in mind that the, how the funding mechanism works through with LCFF is the state allows local property taxes um, that are attributable to your school district to fill up the LCFF bucket first. And if it, it's not sufficient, then the state comes in and funds the difference and that's called state aid. And so it is highly unlikely though, because of where we are at this point in time that we will ever get to the point where our property taxes are, would fill up the entire calculation of LCFF. So at, that we are definitely not ever going to be a basic aid district. We will always be a state aid funded district because of how this formula works. So in addition to LCFF, we also receive um, the, the rest of the funding sources from federal, state, and local sources. So in terms of what's changed since the first interim report, um, these are the four revenue sources. Um, there's been some very minor changes to our student demographics and um, ADA and uh, unduplicated pupil counts that have changing LCFF just slightly. And federal revenues at this point in time of, of the year, we really take a look at where we are in spending our categorical funds in the federal and state buckets. And at this point in time, um, we are projecting that some of our title funds won't be spent by the end of the year. So if you don't spend the funds, you can't recognize the revenues. So we're basically dropping those revenues down and we'll push them, carry them over into the next school year. Um, similar story for the state funds and several of uh, our COVID related funds, our expanded learning grant, expanded learning opportunities program and some of our career tech grants, um, those are not gonna be fully spent. So we're gonna reduce them in the, in the current year and we'll carry those over into the next school year. In local funds um, have increased. We're recognizing about 500,000 of that difference in local donations that have come in over the last few months. And about 200,000 of that is also attributable to um, refunds from STRS that we've received from the state. So in total, we our revenues are down by about $1.2 million from the first interim in December. So moving on to expenditures, we're projecting to spend $261.8 million this year. Over 85% of that is for salaries and benefits for employees. And then the other categories are services and operating expenses and books and supplies. And a very, very small amount of capital outlay. And then in reviewing the changes um, in all the expenditure categories since the first interim, um, certificated salaries, just a small decline there. Um, the classified salaries, we really looked in to these and there's been a lot of changes just due to the pandemic. An example is that we had some overtime and extra time budgeted for transportation staff for field trips and things like that. So just as not as many field trips are happening this year, they are picking up, there are some happening. So we had to take a look at that and reduce those classified salaries for the extra, extra work um, that isn't happening at the same level as it normally is, does this year. So we have a reduction there. And then uh, benefits have decreased by 1.4 million and that's due to the salary increases, salary decreases, um, and also um, when we took a look at where all of our employees were on health benefits as they selected new plans during open enrollment, those new plans started in January. So we're able to recognize a reduction in our health benefits costs as well there. 
And then in terms of books and supplies and the services and operating expenses, those is the primarily where those categorical funds are budgeted typically in books and supplies. And as we realize that those aren't gonna be spent, we reduce those expenses just as we reduce the, the revenues for those title programs and co other COVID related funds that will likely be spent into next year. So in total, we are recognizing that our expenditures have gone down by $6.6 .6 million since first interim. And this is where we are in, for our bottom line in our um, ending balances and reserves in the general fund. Um, as always, we look at the unrestricted and the restricted budgets separately. You can see that we are now projecting a surplus in the unrestricted um, part of the general fund by $5.4 million. That restricted part of the budget still have a deficit as is normal. And so in total, the unrestricted ending balance is projected to be about $34 million by the end of June, which represents an 8.41% reserve. Very important, I wanna point out that that $34 million unrestricted balance does include 11 and a half million of commitments. And commitments are funds that we've set aside to be spent on very specific purposes over the next one to three years. So a couple examples of that is school sites. So school sites um, bring in donations and they have get money for carryover. The district cannot spend that and they can't be part of our reserve or anything. So we, we set that aside and the, that will be given to schools again next year to spend down. Um, we've also set aside $5 million for our pending negotiations at this point in time because they negotiations have not yet settled. The other thing we have set aside is $3.6 million for pension increases that we are anticipating next year. And I'll talk about that in a few more slides. Okay, so as always, um, we're required to do multi-year projections. So um, what is very significant is things have shifted on us quite dramatically since the first interim report because the governor has now released his January budget proposal for next year. And it was very positive outlook. The state has some surpluses and more revenues than they were expecting. So the budget projection for education is much improved at this time than we knew about back in December. So we're able to budget for those things now in the multi-year projection. And so you'll see that our numbers have improved significantly. So this chart just kind of lays through the main, main assumptions in terms of COLA for our LCFF. We are now projecting 5.33% next year and 3.61% for the second year. So just as an example, at, at the first interim for next year, the COLA was projected to be 2.48. So it's like almost doubled, right? So it's, it's, that's why you're gonna see in a moment, the numbers are much better. Um, the second bullet here on revenues is the main reason um, why you're gonna see the, the improvement in the numbers. So this budget assumes what the governor had in his January proposal, and it assumes a three-year rolling average ADA is implemented um, for schools. So and we're gonna go over this a lot. Remember, we were all expecting after we've been held harmless for a couple of years, a funding cliff next year, we're gonna drop down because of our ADA. But instead the governor has proposed kind of a gradual decline in ADA. So this, this multi-year projection does have that assumption in it. And so that brings us to um, our funded ADA then at, for the next two years are um, assumed at 19,438 and 18,778. The, the projections also remove any one-time COVID related funds that we've spent down at this point in time. We absolutely still have some more COVID fund, funds to spend down the next couple of years, but we've removed um, what we spent to date. So we don't double spend anything. Um, and in terms of expenditures, um, a, a really big change, and I'm gonna go into it in more detail, is the PERS and SERS rates are increasing quite significantly like next year and have the percentages there. 
Um, salary increases are not yet included in this multi-year projection because negotiations have not settled yet. We do assume some attrition savings from retirements. We also remove expenditures from any one-time COVID funds. And then this projection also does assume a $10 million overall reduction in expenses that we have been working on. Um, you might recall that at the first interim, we were um, stating that a reduction of $15.5 million was needed. So because of the improvement in the state budget, the rec revenues um, that we were able to recognize at this point in time, um, we, uh, a reduction is still needed, but only $10 million as opposed to the $15.5 million that we were projecting a few months ago. Okay, so with all of that being said, this is what the projection looks like at this point in time. So you can see our estimated revenues um, across the two years. Revenues are still dropping just slightly, but before it was dramatically lower. Revenues are still declining a little bit. Um, and then um, we have our estimated expenditures there. And we are assuming a $10 million ongoing reduction um, across both years. So, what this does is it allows our reserves to be stable across the projection. We're, we're projecting just about right around staying around 10% for the next two years. And um, also note that the um, unrestricted um, deficits are, are now gone. With that $10 million reduction in the improvement in the revenues, um, we now are projecting a surplus in the unrestricted part of our budget. And so that has always been the goal. And so that is where we are at this point in time. Um, I do want to note that um, because salary increases have not yet been included in the projection, um, once negotiations um, does settle, um, that's likely to impact those surpluses in the projection. Okay, and um, because ADA is our lifeblood in schools, that's how we get the bulk of our funding. Remember, LCFF accounts for over 75% of our funds and, it's, and it is um, based primarily on the number of students that we're serving. So I wanna go through this um, in detail. So remember again, that I have built this new uh, multi-year projection on that three-year rolling average um, ADA that the governor has proposed. So this is our historical um, look at our enrollment and our ADA. The solid blue columns are enrollment and the checkered blue columns are ADA. So prior to the pandemic, um, our district had been growing steadily and the first time we had a decline was just prior to the pandemic in 1920, that loss of 134 students. And then we had the dramatic decline um, during the pandemic. And then this year, um, the CalPADS numbers are now final and certified. Um, we did have a loss of an additional 144 students this year. And then we're projecting another 100 for the following year, and then hoping to just stay stable after that. So just wanna point out that you'll notice the ADA columns are higher um, in both of these years, last year and this year. And that is because we've been held harmless at this point in time from the, our enrollment and our ADA declines during the pandemic. Um, so that's why we have been planning for this ADA cliff to drop down significantly um, next year because this, this year is the end of that hold harmless provision um, but instead, luckily, um, what we believe is going to happen now is that we're going to have this gradual ADA relief. So you'll see those checkered columns stepping down slowly instead of dropping right away. Okay. Um, but, Aaron, I have a question. How yes. soon are we going to get this gradual release plan? Uh, well, it, it has, it won't be final until the the legislature signs off on the, on the final budget. So we will not know until the very end of June. Um, although the, 
we're hearing and there's lots of talk of the legislature that this is very likely to happen. So districts are planning for it. The calculation may end up being slightly different, right? But it will be something very similar to this to provide relief to all school districts that have lost enrollment during the, the last couple of years. It is not a definite thing yet, but it's likely to happen, but we honestly will not know until the very end of June. And how will this, will this drastically change our, our, our final budget? It, it, it would, if it doesn't get approved for some reason, it would drastically change our budget, absolutely. And I'm gonna talk about that in a minute, but that's why tonight we're still going to certify as a qualified budget. Even though our numbers look good, it, the main assumption is this, this gradual ADA, ADA relief, which is not definite tonight, right? Highly likely to happen, but not definite. So we're still gonna be qualified. So even though the governor's proposing this gradual ADA relief, um, we will eventually, we're planning to eventually um, be funded on our actual ADA, which is at this point down to 18,200, okay? So luckily we're now gonna be gradually get there and we'll make plans to be able to sustain, sustain our budget um, once we're funded at that lower level. Okay, I just wanted to spend some time tonight talking about um, increases to PERS and STRS contributions. We haven't talked about this yet since, since I worked here. Um, and I just wanna make sure everyone understands the significant impact that um, our pension costs have in our, in our budget. So the state passed PEPRA, which is, was the Public Employees Pension Reform Act back in 2013. And what, because, both of the pension systems at the state level were, were um, underfunded. And so in order to make sure that they had um, enough funds in the long run to pay out um, all of the employees that have worked for so many years, um, they implemented this reform act. And so basically what it did is it required both employees and employers to increase the contributions into the system monthly. So the, employee, the employees had to increase their, their contributions over a couple of years, um, and, but it, it wasn't a huge amount. It was a, a couple percent points higher than they were ha having to pay. But the huge impact was to employers. Employers over this period of time since, since PEPRA has been enacted, um, in our case, we're paying $22 million more um, to the pension systems than we were which is uh, almost a 300% increase over that period of time. You can see it's happening to both PERS and STRS. You can see a, a small dip in the 2021 school year. And the reason for that is the state in that year decided to put a, an influx of state funds into the pension systems to buy down the school's contribution rate, um, which was a huge relief um, for schools. So um, I believe the governor missed an opportunity this year in his budget uh, because he did not address um, PERS and STRS at all. And this is a big, big cost pressure um, to schools. So you can see next year, there's a pretty significant jump. Um, for us, we're gonna have to pay um, $3.6 million um, more into um, PERS and STRS. Um, the PERS rate is increasing a little over 3% next year, and the STRS rate is increasing a little over 2%. So we are preparing for that, and those increases have been built into this projection. And so this is what our general fund ending balance and reserves look like. It has some history built in there. Um, the columns are our ending balances in dollars and the yellow line running through there is our reserve percentage. So at this point in time, you can see for this year, we're projecting to end the year with about 8.4% reserves. And then we're gonna hold steady at 9.7 you know, and 10, 10% for the next two years. So we are submitting a qualified budget tonight um, because there's, there's two big things that haven't been finalized at this point in time. Number one is that ADA relief, okay? 
Um, that is a huge number for us. It's about $12 million next year more than we would otherwise have received, okay? Um, the second thing is our $10 million in reductions have not yet been finalized, right? We are working, working through that process right now. And so because of those two things are not absolutely certain, um, we are submitting qualified. As long as all of those things take place and the state budget um, gets finalized and everything's as we expect it to be in June, we should be out of that qualified status as we move into next school year. So the next steps at this point are to prepare our third interim report. We'll be doing that and presenting that at the May board meeting. We're gonna to continue to monitor the state budget process, particularly at this point where next, the next step is to wait for the governor's May revise, which should be issued sometime around May 10th. And we're gonna to continue to develop our LCAP and our strategic plan and graduate profile. And then we're gonna work on implementing those budget reductions of $10 million. Um, the next item on the agenda is for the board to approve a resolution to commit to um, a reduction of at least that $10 million. And with that, I do recommend approval of the second interim report and the qualified certification. And I'll take any questions if you have them. Of the big why us question. Um, I mean, we see that the rest of the school districts in Southern California are not experiencing the same issues that we are. Um, so can you just kind of elaborate on why us? Mm -hmm. Sure. There are certainly are some, right? There, there's a list of all the other districts that I think there were 21 that submitted a qualified certification at the first interim report. Um, but the majority, you're right, the majority of districts aren't feeling um, the pain in their budget as, as much as we are. So um, I think there's probably a couple things that um, can we can attribute to that. Um, and one is that reality is under LCFF, we're funded differently than other school districts. Um, we don't get that extra concentration grant funds and something that we haven't talked about, I'm not sure you know, is um, a lot of the COVID funds were based, the, the how they were distributed were based on your student demographics, right? So uh, a lot of um, the same concentration grant funded districts also received even more COVID funds than we did. Um, as an example, you know, this we received about 62 million in total. This stuff was exactly the same size as, as our district um, received a little, a little over 100 million. And it's just because they the, their, their demographics are different. Um, and so because of that, they receive more funding. So they're able to do different things, more things than we are. Um, another thing, um, the reality is, is that structural deficits have been in this district's budget for a long period of time. Um, I, know, I know that you know that well. Um, and for whatever reason, decisions weren't made to correct those structural deficits. And we know that when you postpone making those right sizing decisions, um, that deficit problem tends to compound over time. So, uh, that's the reason why I think that we're, we're in this situation at this point in time. Erin, yeah. I have a question. If we choose not to um, qualify this or vote to qualify this, what does that mean for our district? Um, it, just, it just means that the, the county office will take a look at it and they could change the certification if they um, decided that they thought we were qualified and we, and we weren't. Referring to, I'm sorry, are you referring to this item? Or are you talking about the next one with the resolution for the, the reductions? Oh, the redu I'm sorry, it is the reduction. Oh, okay. okay. The $10 million reductions. If we didn't do that, um, it, it, it you're just, in my mind, you're kicking the can down the road, right? Another year at some point, and we'll need to be done. Um, and if you, the longer you wait, 
again, what happens is like that $10 million that we need to reduce by today um, will probably grow next year if you wait. Will be larger if you wait to make those reductions. Thank you. Sorry to confuse you. In the multi-year projection, then, uh, if the if the ten million dollars reductions aren't made, what does that do to the the deficits? It immediately creates deficits, right? The deficits will go back. We'll have deficits now in the budget. Thank you. Okay. Do I have a motion to approve the 2021-22 second interim report and qualified budget certification? A motion to approve. And I'll second. Moved by Jamie, seconded by Sarah to approve the second interim report and qualified certification as presented. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. 4.2, resolution number 56-2122. Resolution of the Governing Board of San Marcos Unified School District identifying the amount of budget reductions needed in 22-23. That's you. So this is a, a, a resolution um, recommended by the County Office of Education because we're qualified, they require this. Um, to go forward to them as, and it becomes supplemental to the second interim report. And it just states that we um, are committing to make $10 million of reductions. It doesn't, there's no specificity to what those reductions are, just that there'll be um, at least $10 million reductions made for, the, for next school year. Do I have a motion to adopt resolution number 56-2122? I move to adopt resolution number 56-2122. I'll second. Moved by Sarah, seconded by Sydney to adopt resolution number 56-2122 as presented. All those in favor say aye. Any opposed? For the next two agenda items, 4.3 and 4.4, the governing board will be acting as the legislative body of community facilities, district number 14. 4.3, school facilities funding agreement, annexation number 2022-1 to community facilities, district number 14 of the San Marcos Unified School District, Beezer acting for the San Marcos Unified School District and acting as the legislative body of community facilities district number 14. Erin is here for Rachel. I believe poor Rachel is trying to make it here, but I don't think she's going to make it till 530. I think we neglected to tell her that it was a special meeting and it started earlier. So she was planning to be here, but not so you got me. I think I can work my way through it though. Okay. So tonight uh, we're looking at the first step at a three-step process for the um, annexation um, into CFD number 14. Um, you might recall that this um, CFD 14 was set up as an annexable um, CFD so that smaller development projects could choose in the future to annex into CFD um, 14 if they chose to, whereas their, if their development wasn't large enough to, to have an, their own individual CFD, they could choose to annex into it. So this is our um, first project, Beezer Homes, that um, is proposing to annex into CFD 14. So we just have some data on the um, development. Um, so it's built um, by Beezer Homes. It's in the city of Vista. Um, it's proposed to have 103 townhomes um, with square footage between 1120 and 1640. And um, as just as a reminder, the CFDs, um, 
the purpose of them is to have a mitigation payment to the district and that represents approximately 130% of what a level two or level um, one developer fee would be. So in this case, basically that means um, that it will produce approximately $200,000 additional funds for school facilities to be built above what the level um, two or level one developer fees would otherwise um, generate. And so next um, we have a map kind of now of where um, the CFD 14 is because it's an annexable CD. You're gonna see very, very small development. So it's the, the yellow portions that are outlined in red. Um, so we have one way on the west side of our district and one way now on the um, east side of our district as well. Both small projects, perfect to annex into this CFD 14 that we created. So the CFD formation process is, is a three-step process. So tonight we're on step number one. Um, which requires a resolution of intention to, to annex Beezer Homes into CFD 14. Um, and then we will have two additional um, board meetings to finish up the, the process. So the resolution of formation and then the second reading of the ordinance is the third step. So this is a timeline um, of how this will work. So tonight we'll do the resolution of intention um, and then at the next board meeting in April, we'll do that resolution of formation, and then we'll have a final uh, reading of the ordinance at the June 21st board meeting. That's it. Do I have any questions, guys? Do I have a motion to approve the school facilities funding agreement? A motion to approve. I'll second. Moved by Jamie, seconded by Carlos to approve the school facilities funding agreement as presented. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. 4.4 resolution number 5721-22. Resolution of intention of the governing board of the San Marcos Unified School District acting as the legislative body of Community Facilities District Number 14 of the San Marcos Unified School District to annex territory into Community Facilities District Number 14 of the San Marcos Unified School District. Do I have a motion to adopt Resolution Number 57-2122? I move to adopt. I'll second. Moved by Sarah, seconded by Jamie to adopt Resolution Number 57-2122 as presented. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. The governing board will no longer be acting as the legislative body of community facilities district number 14. Consent agenda. Uh, do I have a motion to approve the consent agenda for discussion purposes? The motion to approve. And I'll second. Moved by Jamie, seconded by Sarah to approve the consent agenda for discussion purposes. Do we have any discussion? All those in favor? Do we do? Aye. Yeah. Yep. Uh, any opposed? <laughs> All right. Motion carries. That was great way to end that. Uh, six point out information. Uh, six point one enrollment report for month six. Tonight we have the enrollment. Uh, report for month six, which ended on February 18th. At that time, we had a total of 19,606 students enrolled, which was um, uh, 98 fewer students in that same exact time period last year, but a glimmer of hope. Um, they, there was 15 students that enrolled over the prior month extra. Closing items, uh, 7.1 organizational matters. The next regular meeting of the governing board will take place on Tuesday, April 19th, 2022 at 6.30 p.m. Uh, we are now adjourning into closed session.